Well, welcome. <clears throat> Maybe the last peaceful evening of the weekend, uh, but uh, here we are uh, in a very secure building. And, uh, it's great to see such a large turnout uh, tonight in another one of the Kerry uh, lecture series. I'm Bill Slusinger, president of the Institute, and I want to welcome you here tonight. Um, the, uh, I want to welcome in particular the members of the Aldo Leopold Society who, through their contributions here, help make uh, these lectures possible, uh, as well as a variety of other things that uh, discretionary and unrestricted funds uh, allow a nonprofit like the Cary Institute uh, to do things that uh, we all like to do, and we can all participate in so many things. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Peter Kariba tonight. Uh, Peter and I were graduate students a long time ago uh, at Cornell. Um, I think we overlapped two or three years there. Uh, and uh, I've, uh, of course, followed his career uh, ever since, which led him uh, to the University of Washington's uh, Department of Zoology, where he worked his way up through the professorial ranks. Um, then, uh, I think like many, uh, mid-career scientist uh, kind of felt that higher calling, you know, was, is this all going to be academics for the rest of life? Uh, and the answer was no. Uh, and with that, uh, he quickly found himself as uh, chief scientist for the Nature Conservancy. Uh, and many of you have probably seen his picture in Nature Conservancy magazine in the last uh, couple of years uh, in a variety of interviews and capacities. Uh, one of which, of course, was a wonderful article when he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences a couple of years ago. I don't know what they'll do to this year. The, now in the National Academy of Sciences, there'll probably be another article in the same vein. Uh, but uh, those are two of uh, his accolades uh, that uh, certainly uh, bring him uh, of note uh, to speak to us tonight. Uh, Peters, I think, has... Uh, uh, rattles the cages with his message on environment. The old ways and the old ways of thinking about things are not likely to work. Uh, we need to turn the subject on its head. We need to turn the uh, clientele and the supporters of the environment uh, on its head and broaden it uh, to recognize that the country is increasingly diverse. It can't simply be a white middle class uh, suburban uh, effort to uh, preserve environment and preserve biodiversity, but we all need to be in this and we all need to see advantages uh, from being in it. Uh, he has a book uh, which will be available, uh, courtesy of Merit Books, who are available for purchase afterwards called Conservation Science, Balancing the Needs of People and Nature, uh, with Peter and Michelle Barbier uh, as uh, co-authors. And uh, without further ado, let me turn this over to Peter tonight, uh, who will speak on environmental vision uh, for the future. Peter, very good. Many thanks for being here. Great. And it's a uh, to be here. I spent a lot of my youth in upstate New York. My father was a construction worker, and I could drive around here and see banks that I built. And I had a landscape company, and I could see houses by the landscape. But, um, uh, I, I, I bet you everybody in here knows Rachel Carson, and a remarkable woman. And thanks to her, initially the environmental movement got a very, very good start. We're about to come to the, to the 50th anniversary of her book signing the spring. Courageous woman. She, you know, she, she hoped to go on to get a PhD. She got a master's. She had a small family on a farm, and uh, her father got sick. She had to take care of everybody. She, so she couldn't go on for a PhD because there weren't much prospects for women getting jobs in universities then. She went to work for a while. Uh, was the equivalent of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as a technical writer. And she had a very understanding boss, and she did technical writing and synthesizing things. But of course, she, she wrote her famous book. And I want to give you some sense of the progress she made. Um, this was a full page ad at Time Magazine. Um, you know, in the 50s, so that social progress as well. But, uh, um, and, and it's much thanks to her that we have a lot of our environmental legislation. And I think if you, if you go back and, and read some of the testimony before Congress, 
you'll realize that this golden decade of these Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, and Endangered Species Act really can be traced to her. Because not only did her books sell record amounts, all the bookshelves immediately, she went on television. I bet you remember this. You can see it at the Smithsonian. She went on CBS Reports. And it was the highest ranked um, rating show they had. And she was very, very balanced. And she was terrific on television. She had been attacked as a communist, a radical, a hysterical woman because she didn't have a PhD. She didn't know what she was talking about. There was um, also, she was um, unmarried, didn't have children. There were implications about her, her sexual proclivities. And she was really very much publicly harassed and ridiculed. She went on television and did an amazing job. Just was asked aggressive questions and just was the epitome of, of reason and thoughtfulness. And, and after that, you know, the, the President Kennedy had a, um, had, a, had a commission on the environment. A lot of this legislation got, st got started there and they all signed her. Well now, you'll see, um, Books like this, and this is just one. It's the first one I read. Uh, in my circles, in the, in the environmental world, uh, inside DC, I don't live inside DC, I live in Seattle, but in those groups of environmental groups and advocacy and so forth, this book was much talked about. It had a huge impact. And this book um, talked about our failure to address climate change, and why is that? Why did nobody deal with it? It, it talked about our failure to attract public support. Very famous quote if, uh, in this book, which is basically this. Um, if Martin Luther King had been an environmentalist, instead of I have a dream, his speech would have been I have a nightmare. And uh, that was one of their criticisms of the environmental movement. And I agree with that criticism. And you can take poll after poll. I'm not going to show you that much. Uh, but people, we talk. You're here probably because you care something about nature. You care about the environment. You care about the conservation. But you talk to each other. Sometimes you lose sight of what a minority we are. And it really interferes with our ability to do things. So this is just one figure. Uh, this happens to, actually it's from the Nicholas School poll, but um, showing an increasing percentage of people that think environmentalists are unreasonable. And it would be much higher now. Much higher now. We've developed a narrative about that. So cabin and trade fail. Read the newspapers, you talk to other environmentalists. Here's the narrative. Special industry, special interests on the basis of industry spent all this money and they won by outspending us. So the Koch brothers did this. In reality, for cap and trade, the environmental movement was very well organized. They set up a new nonprofit, Climate Works, and the environmental movement, if anything, outspent the opposition. It's not part of their narrative, is it? It's not just money. So what I'm going to go through for the first half is criticize, in, in a sense of, in a provocative way, sort of challenge us to rethink some of our standard ways of looking at the environment and talking about the environment. And then I'll get constructive and say about the path forward. And I should emphasize that um, when I speak here, um, I speak personally. I, I don't speak on behalf of the Nature Conservancy. Although, uh, obviously, I carry these ideas to the nature, so we see I try to persuade them of uh, some of these points. And what I'm going to talk about as our mistakes are this notion of pristine wilderness, pitting the environment against the economy, this sort of apocalyptic, doom and gloom, fragile nature vision, and our major rejection of technology. Let's start with pristine wilderness. Uh, I don't know how many of you read Edward Abbey, but when I was a college student, I read him, and I was totally energized by him. 
you know, it was the late it was the 60s era of uh, radical political fun, and I just thought he was great. I met up with a friend recently, he's a historian who, who did his PhD thesis uh, on Ed, Edward Abbey, and he, um, he got his journals, and read his actual personal journals. So Edward Abbey wrote a lot of environmental tracks, one of the most famous is Desert, Desert Solitaire. And he celebrated, like many um, in, environmentalists, he celebrated this notion of pristine, untouched by humans. It's, it's so the highest value of anything is something that's untouched by humans. That's the highest value. That's just the best thing in the world. And he also celebrated, in this case, the sort of notion like, like uh, Henry David Thoreau of, of this lone man out in the wilderness being inspired and strong. And exactly, you, you mentioned uh, the Leopold. All the Leopold's writings are very different than this. They're very different. But um, but Edward Abbey celebrated this. It's interesting to, to, to read his journals and read his books. He go to the second chapter of Desert Solitaire. And at the very end of the second chapter, he has an excerpt where he's talking about the darkness of the night. He just is the first of his two years there and it's working for the Park Service. He's the darkness of the night, and he goes, oh, in the darkness and no lights. The loveliness of it all. The loveliness of no one around. In his journal, his personal journal, he wrote, oh, Christ, I am so lonely. Rita, what, Rita was his wife. Rita, why did you leave me? She went back to New Jersey. <laughs> he never mentions it in his book, but he, he was so miserable being by himself in that wilderness. Uh, the first year, that he had a rhythm in the second year. But you don't get that from where he does it solitaire. He created this myth. And the pristineness. The other thing is, you read his description of the environment of it being untouched. But he's not a very faithful reporter. Because at the same time, that's when we were doing all the atomic bomb testing. There were 44 ex, uh, you know, test explosions that he could see. <laughs> but now he you know, managed to find a way into his celebration of pristine wilderness. This is significant. Because when you hold up this notion of untouched, not a single footstep of humans, it leads us to, in my business, which is conservation, what I call fortress con conservation. Keep people out. Have there been no, um, you know, impact on people? They can't tread in their natural parks. They're not to be there. And it creates conservation refugees. Less and less is this happening, but it's an important part of the legacy of the conservation movement, and kind of a sad part. And then, not only is it a sad part, it's an unsuccessful part. Because when you keep people out, when you say it's pristine, and you'll find this, you have parks they have to have armed guards. Is that a sustainable path to conservation? To have to arm, have an army do it? That, if you just pause and think about that with common sense, that's not a sustainable path to conservation. But that's the way it actually still is in many places. And the armed guards, this is these are cases of armed guards in, in Uganda um, arresting somebody for poaching wildlife. But on top of that, it they often backfires. Uh, this park was created and it was celebrated, and um, they, they um, moved out the tribes that were in there and because they wanted to create an empty of people, untouched by people. Huge Fuhrer created an enormous amount of, not quite a civil war, but a lot of, of, of violence. And then the government had to reverse itself and let the people back in. Well, prior to that, the people had really no problem with conservative things. This is what happened when they let them back in. They killed wildlife because they suddenly thought wildlife was their enemy. They didn't think this before. They never thought that before. But they thought it when it was pitched that you've got to get out of here because it's got all this valuable wildlife. So that's the pristine wilderness. Venus on all that. What about jobs versus nature? Spot it out. Um, one of uh, my first jobs was at the University of Washington. 
And I was still under the influence of Edward Abbey, and I fashioned myself some sort of environmental hero. And I ended up being an expert witness in the spotted owl trials that were held in a federal district court in downtown Seattle. And this is about closing off parts of the forest to logging to protect spotted owls. And uh, I had kids that were two years old and four years old at the time. And I remember testifying in the, in the office, I mean, in the, in the courthouse, and lining the back of the room were loggers with kids on their shoulders. You know, I picture right here, a two-year kid, put on your shoulders like this, and their legs here, you know, little. Well, they're not going to speak up, because they speak up when they're thrown out of the courthouse. But they shook the kids' legs, and the kids cried. <laughs> and they had signs around them that said, you care more about owls than my children who are starving. It, and that made, you know, I was so smug in my view. And I thought about that. It, 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 it actually affected me. It made me think about the consequences of what um, conservation was. And you can see, these, these are, this now is not an isolated example. You see this over and over again. Save fish, ruin humans. Um, MPA is, is, is an abbreviation for marine protected area. That's a marine park. He goes, he goes apartheid because you keep people out. Save a law, eat an owl. You know, and on and on. And it has a consequence. Those are not just slides. The data show it. This is the owl poll that's been taken every year. And it asks this question about uh, which is, is, is more, which, you know, which statement do you agree with more? The environment should be a priority or economic growth should be a priority. And in the 90s and 2000, the environment was still doing okay, around 70 to 60 percent. Ever since then, it's been falling and falling and falling. It's not down to 31 percent. So effectively, only 31 percent would it say the environment um, should be given its own priority. Turn to the next slide. The fragile nature is sort of apocalyptic and delicate mother nature. You, you know, you just do something wrong and nature's going to break. And that's certainly, that's true, you know, even in my organization, I bet you if you went down to the Nature Conservancy's website and then you Google fragile anything, fragile river, fragile whatever, you would find a lot of examples. We'd love to use that word fragile. Again, it, 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 and what's so significant about it is that if things are fragile, then it's non-negotiable. You draw a line in the sand. There's no negotiating with human activities because it's broken forever. It actually leads you to specific policy responses. So, and, you know, associated with that is all these examples of Empty skies, empty ocean. Empty skies uh, you know, about neotropical migratory birds. Empty oceans about overfishing. They're totally apocalyptic. And not true scientifically. Almost every one of those could be debunked as trends. It's not to say that there aren't problems, but they're all gross overstatements. Incredible overstatements. Without going back in. Well, I happen to be doing field work at Mount St. Helens. And Mount St. Helens uh, was quite a spectacle. Um, and I remember going out there immediately after the, uh, the uh, eruption, and that was the first colonizer. It's a lupin plant. I also took a lupin plant. And they're probably, uh, this is probably the only shot of that lupin plant without 100 biologists around. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it really was intensively studied. <laughs> uh, as it spread. But th this is, is only 15 years later. It's been much more than that. I just had this slide of the same area. You go down there, and it's remarkable recovery. Now, this is not a human thing, but it, just, it, it got me thinking. This was part of my basic ecological research I was doing, was a recovery of this totally devastated system. And um, we, I was just surprised by how vigorous and luxuriantly it came back. This is the hydrogen bomb, tested in the bikini at all. It vaporized the island and boiled the ocean. 
on the ocean. Vaporize the iron. There was an expedition that went back there three years ago. This is what it found. 25% more coral species and biomass of coral. Now, I'm not going to say that, that, that uh, you know, nuclear explosion is a good thing or that it's totally recovered. I'm not sure I'd be eating the fish from them. But nonetheless, the recovery, the, 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 the expedition that went there, the divers took these photos were astonished. Astonished by the recovery. I don't think you would call that fragile. Yet Chernobyl, um, again, a major nuclear disaster. It's, it's the best place for wildlife in Russia. Bears, these are the Mongolian horses, the, the wild horses. It's a, one of the biggest herds outside the Gobi. Um, for those horses, it's thriving, lots of raptors. And it's, it's basically a wildlife haven. Even though there's still high radiation on the by the way. Again, not advocating, not saying these things don't do damage. And you wouldn't want to be there. You know, I wouldn't send my kids in there, spend time there. But it doesn't paint the picture of fragile nature, does it? You know, a less dramatic, but one of my favorite ones, is our own greater Yellowstone ecosystem. I remember taking, uh, as a kid, like many people, my parents took me across the country to look at the great national parks and going to Yellowstone and not seeing things that now I just took my kids out there. And you can count on going places and seeing bison and wolves and grizzly bears. You know, we've recovered the populations, reintroduced them, they're thriving, and it's, it's, it's sort of reinstituted the intact and the Lewis and Clark megaphone. You would have never thought that was going to happen uh, when I was in the 60s with my family vacation. You would have never thought there was a prospect of that. Again, not exactly a picture of a fraction. This is a more controversial one. Everybody recognizes this. This is, of course, Deepwater Horizon. But I use this. We don't know it yet. We don't really know. The science hasn't come in about what the consequences of the deep water horizon is. But I use this as an example of how, um, how I should say, the bias, maybe that's a, how, how drawn we are to this disaster, apocalyptic, you know, uh, fragile nature storyline and narrative. I, I don't know if you read the article in The New Yorker um, uh, about the, sort of journalism and the deep water horizon. But the, one of the things that they report there, and I've checked with our staff who are in Louisiana, Mississippi, is you saw those pictures of Anderson Cooper, you know, in the oil slick areas. He could drive long and hard to find those. He could drive long and hard. In fact, there were only 44 miles of that huge coastline that were having the oil slick. There was a lot of oil damage, but those type, that picture that kept repeating, you know, on, on CNN, you had to look really hard for it. And reporters would go down there looking for it, they couldn't find it. And then, of course, we had this pie chart that was put out that Jane Luchenko, the head of NOAA, put out. And what he pointed out was a, a lot of the oil was being eaten and digested much faster than anybody expected. They probably should have expected it because we have data from other oil spills. It's warm water. You know, Exxon Valdez lingers, it's cold water, warm water, much more microbial activity. There's a natural seep there, having natural seeps so there's a rich microbial community adapted to eating oil. But when she put this up, I remember I, I worked with James, I still work with Noah. Um, she got lambasted based in the media as it being a conspiracy to cover up how much damage there was. Jane has some of the highest integrity I know, but the quotes about her were really nasty. And it's again, it's because we weren't willing to accept any good news. That was good news. It's not that, as I said, the science isn't in, there was some damage. But nonetheless, this was some good news, and we just couldn't accept it. It, it went against our doom and gloom. Oh my God, we just destroyed the planet. Knee-jerk rejection of technology. 
Um, this one drives me nuts. The dominant factor that converts land, natural habitat, is agriculture. So if I care about species, biodiversity, and nature, I care about agriculture. And I'm not going to care about agriculture to say stop feeding people. I'm going to care about agriculture to say how can we feed people and still maintain habitats for our species and other sort of environmental functions. Yet the environmental movement in many cases, including many conservation NGOs, is just nature against genetically modified organisms. That's not to say genetically modified organisms and genetically modified crops don't have risk. But de facto, just being knee-jerked against them does not make sense. I'll come back to that uh, later with an example of a genetically modified plant that has great potential for conservation in Africa. When I, I worked, uh, before I jumped to being chief scientist, I was uh, head of the division director, um, division of conservation for NOAA. So I was heavily involved with management and, and biological research of fisheries. This is a full page thing from New York Times about the dams on the Snake River. Again, the narrative about those dams, the conservation of our government, just wants those dams removed. Now those dams do do some negative things. But this is all couched in the Endangered Species Act. So if you want a free running river, there's no question the dams mess up your, your flows and some of your hydrological processes. But all this discussion is around one species, chirp salmon. And it turns out we spent billions of dollars re-engineering the dams to make them salmon friendly. Redesigning the turbines, having stress and spillways, having special ladders and so forth. Yet there's this enormous push against the dams with this distrust of technology. This is another full page ad saying if we don't take out those dams, the Snake River salmon, Chinook salmon, uh, will be gone by 2017. Well, I, when I worked for NOAA, I used to love to do this to audiences. They made me go on a lot of um, town hall meetings. The, the political leader, Clinton's appointee, would stand up and, and answer the easy questions. Then he'd leave for the bar and say, Dr. Krieger will handle your technical questions. <laughs> but um, it's true. <laughs> but, um, I got this thing about, you know, the, 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 the Chinook salmon are, are going down. I knew, the, I knew the demography, I knew the survival rates of the Chinook salmon. I knew their life history, I knew their, their biology, their biology pretty well. I knew that was going to happen. And so, uh, I would bet in my house, I would say, anybody want to bet their house? Because dams aren't going to be out by 2017, and the Chinook salmon will still be here in good numbers by 2017. So I offer that back to you as well. The dams are not going to be out by 2017. Um, and Chinook salmon are not going to be gone. Unlike this AI, which is signed on by every major environmental group, not major conservancy, but um, pretty much every other one. Overstated. And it becomes that instead of being scientific, it's become a religion. The sort of environment conservation instead of being a rational, scientific discussion of trade-offs, stakeholders, and you know what future do we want for the planet in the context of the many different people have needs that, it's become a religion. Another way of describing it is misanthropic, anti-growth, anti-technology, dogmatic, purist, zealous, exclusive, romantic pastoralism. Everything is don't do, don't do, don't do. No wonder why the public doesn't listen. That's not a good message. Stop, stop, stop. Don't, don't, don't. It doesn't work. That's wrong scientifically, frankly. So I would argue that the future, so the future, the future really is restore, reconnect, people, communities, growth and opportunity, technology for nature, green infrastructure, and greening business. This contrast. That's the cultural legacy and communication legacy of the environmental movement of now. This is where we need to go. In reality, 
I think you all realize we need to go red lights and green lights and yellow lights. But I'm, I want to paint a, a little bit more extreme picture here for the sake of discussion. So let's, you know, think about this. So the first thing is, quit romanticizing. Deal with the way nature is. Scientists know we're in a new geological epoch. Got a name for it, Anthropocene. It's the human that dominated epoch. And all the data, everything, everywhere we look, we see a human footprint. Quit holding up pristine, untouched wilderness as the ideal. I love this slide from NASA. You go to NASA's site and see these slides, updated. These are actually a couple years old, um, of the lights in the sky at night. They're spectacular, and it's really interesting. You know, of course, dams. You know, there's now more water is behind dams and runs and rivers. So that's how much involved in the hydrological cycle. Because um, this is the uh, the uh, Three Rivers Dam. So humans have had, and scientists here at Cary, I'll back up to this. Humans have just had a huge impact on. Uh, we dominate the planet. We move more sediment and rock for our construction purposes the geological processes here. Our nitrogen emissions dominate the natural nitrogen cycle. We've totally taken over the hydrological cycle in many places. You know, we've converted more land. It's just going on and on. Now you may be sad about that, and that's fine, but the reality, this is the world we live in. Let's move forward. Let's move forward and make as good a future as possible. But don't hold up pristine motors. You can't go anywhere and not find iron that. You go to the Arctic and you take the fatty tissue, you know, polar bear, and you'll see our cows. The second thing we need to do is celebrate and connect people with nature and cities. Because this graph is not Democrats and Republicans, it's the crossing lines represent the population, uh, uh, with the red line being rural and the blue line being um, the percentage of cities. And it was a couple of years ago that half the world, for the first time, more than half the world's population was in cities. And it's just climbing, climbing, climbing. So we all live in cities now. And that has consequences for our connections to the environment. And there is nature in cities. So I've been arguing in my organization that conservation just is not about those pristine places. It's about nature in cities. And we're actually doing something about it. We actually started to have a program on that. This is uh, you know, from San Francisco, Golden Gate Bridge. You, uh, you can find coyotes coming into cities. So the story about the mountain lion that came across from uh, you know, the west and came all the way out here. There, there really can be a lot of spectacular nature in cities. Peregrine Falcon, which is recovered um, very much at the half of them. Tom Kay was a Cornell professor. And uh, does spectacularly well in cities. And it's a thrill to see a pair of falcon come down and swoop down and take a pigeon. <laughs> but you know, that's, that, but that, I mean, that's a nature experience. That's creation. And it's, it is neat. There's no question about it. This is, you know, I, I put this up because this is, um, this is the, if you ever fly in San Jose, it's the Guadalupe River, which used to just be, and it's not a particularly nice side, side site for it. But it used to be literally just, you know, littered with syringes and garbage and a strong homeless population camping out there. And the San Jose has gone on a major effort to reclaim the river. It still doesn't look too pretty, but there's not steelhead driving it. Steelhead. You go out there and see steelhead somewhere there driving it. And I have a personal note, I grew up in the east and my dad took me to Pittsburgh um, when I was he, he grew up in Scranton initially as a coal miner, and he took me to Pittsburgh, a big city. And I remember going to Pittsburgh in the river, and it was putrid. This would be about 1960. Yeah, probably 60. And it was so putrid that there was no property value. You didn't want to have houses near the, near the rivers in Pittsburgh because it was so foul. You didn't keep boats in the water too long because it was too corrosive, and there certainly weren't any fish. And then it struck me a couple of with the last summer or the summer before, this last summer, the Ecological Society had the means of this Rhode Island back for the first time. And they've done an amazing job restoring those rivers. So there's vast fish, fishing tournaments now in the river. 
fishing terms are good. Good habitat in the restored riparian zone, a nice place to run, a major success story for river restoration. So you can have major cities, and by the way, this also speaks to the resilience versus fragility of nature. You can restore it. I just saw this morning's newspaper. Oops. Story of my life. Whoops. Um, you know, if you read the New York Times, there's an article about the Los Angeles River, which the EPA thought was so bad they wanted to not call, say it's not a river anymore. <laughs> Literally, they, they said it doesn't qualify as a river. But now there's a restoration effort, and there's, there's pictures of kayakers in there, even stretches of habitat in Los Angeles. That's good for conservation. We should pay attention to that. Because it allows people to connect to nature. And it's good for the cities. Good for the quality of life. It's not just about the seventeen you know, so. There's a neat book coming out, um, maybe out any week now, by a friend of mine, Emma Maris, uh, called Rambunctious Garden. It's it's popularly written. It's it's really well done. Unlike my book, which is really boring. Um, this book is really fun, and I encourage you to to, to look at it. Rambunctious Garden, and her story is that that in these human environments. There's still a robustness and, a, and surprising species and, and neat aspects of nature. Broaden the constituency. Okay. Teddy Roosevelt, John Muir, your father, Sarah Cole. Some people are going to get mad at me for reviewing this next thing. John Muir was one of the worst racists ever. And he was, and it's not a matter of just his time. Not a matter of just his time. He had, he, and he talked about urban people the same way. I mean, he thought cities were dirty, and um, and cities were dirty, and they were filthy, and the people in them were unclean, and just you know somehow lesser people. That's the founder of conservation. And remember what we did when we founded, you know, when Yosemite got founded. We built a fort. And kick the Native Americans out. They had troops there to keep the Native Americans out of Yosemite, in our great national park. This is not a broad constituency. And let me remind you of the demographic shift that's upon us. This is the projection. It's actually going faster than this. So this projection is two years ago. The latest census indicates it's accelerating enormously. But by 2050, for sure. Brown will be the majority, white will be the minority. And now ask yourself, what's the percent composition of the environmental organizations on their staff or their membership? It's about 95 to 99% white. No diversity whatsoever. So we did a thing. So we did the nation service actually initiated uh, a a program of cities works with environmental high schools uh, with strong minority populations, and we um, <laughs> and we um, and we got money from a corporation to expand it because we take these kids out into the work on our nature reserves and they and they work and they do science and they collect data. But as we as we wanted to expand it, we wanted to learn more about it. So we had these focus groups. So we did these focus groups in San Antonio. Oakland, New York City, and um, Miami, I'm sorry, Miami. And it's just astonishing what the view of this youth is about us. Us, I mean, me as a conservationist, you see it here. Uh, the moderator would ask, you know, imagine a person who cares about nature and describe that very person. So this is their vision of the tree hugger. Uh, preaching. Why? She has money. She is nice, but I would not invite her to a party. She's uptight. <laughs> That's actually not so untrue. You, I, I'm sure you've seen how preachy we can be. We can be pretty preachy, Kevin. It's not really that pleasant to be that preachy. Uh, it, it, we got to publish this because it's, it, we have really good data on this. So, you know, our program, which takes these kids, an amazing success stories. And has them collect data and sort of do conservation with us. Remove invasive species, monitor, and do conservation, and send them out of college. Um, 
There was just a special about it on CBS News um, in the morning uh, last week. Yeah, last week. There's another one coming out on NBC News. But here's some other quotes from me. I know I look out, but I care about nature too. My grandma says not to go to the woods because that's where they hang people. Are you going to reject me because I'm Muslim? But again, you know, this, this is not a constituency environmentalists that pay any attention to. Pay any attention to. So one of our striking, we've done a follow. We follow, we take measures on our alumni. And many of you may know that the U.S. is facing a science crisis where not enough kids are majoring in science. So 6% of college students are majoring in science. There's major national programs to increase that. Guess what our rate is for alumni from our program to graduate with science degree? 30%. We beat any federal program. And these are your most unlikely people. And this, you know, if you have your original biases, you would think that inner city kids from low income families and not the best of schools would not be heading up in college science majors at that rate. They are. But I some of you. Embrace technology. Um, this is the American chestnut. Some of you may know, I mean, the chestnut light wiped out the uh, American chestnut. Genetically, engine, genetic engineering, inserting genes from other species that are resistant to uh, that light are some of the best hopes for restoring chestnut. But the real one I want to talk about is cassava. Because environmental conservation groups have been very negative about genetically modified crops and instituted boycotts and block shipments and done all sorts of things. They have now genetically engineered cassava to have four times the existing protein content. That is a huge deal. Cassava does not require much water, does not require nitrogen. It's a low input crop that goes all over Africa. Here's a case where genetic engineering, technology, biotechnology, I'm not saying it'll work, but it certainly deserves the chance, has the chance to both feed Africa and do so in a way that doesn't destroy the environment with excessive nutrient and water usage. Four times the protein. That's the main problem, because cassava doesn't have protein. You can't really live on just cassava alone. They're also engineering in a disease resistance. Uh, all this is in the greenhouse, but a few field trials. Now, I would like to give my organization to be behind that. They're not against it or for it now, but I would like us to be progressive enough to be one of the first environmental groups to come out and say, here's a technical solution that is good for the environment and good for Let's not be ideological about technology. Partner with business. So we formed a partnership with Dow Chemical Company. They should have said yes. In fact, my science shop has. Um, and our reasoning is Dow operates in 44 countries. It uses water for a lot of its processes, it needs incredibly clean water, so it has some understanding of the value of the environment. It actually does, I mean, a lot of, uh, you know, semiconductor, a lot of computer companies, a lot of uh, industry requires really clean water. So it's nearing us clean water. Of course, being a chemical company has an effluent that can be damaging. Because it's global, it's vulnerable to social sort of messages going out across you, you know, the internet, so when it enters a new country, they're going to be opposition to it. And it is genuinely interested. It, it, its CEO is one of these CEOs, they're often CEOs like this, that um, you grow up eat fish and is genuinely interested in the environment. So we're partly we're down, just started it, just really started the science part of it um, a month ago. But our goal is to interact with them about how to change their operations and their siting to do minimum damage to the environment, and if they do do damage, to mitigate it, to compensate us for it. Often companies have more, 
you know, you know, and I know that's not from experience, we can have to talk about it in the question and answer. But the old narrative is a company goes and does something, and it gets so far down the path, and it's not really a good thing to do for the environment, then it's sued, and then it's a constant battle, the company loses money or loses time, and it's really unnecessary. Because there's often choices that if you dealt with interact with the companies at the very beginning, and said, stay away from there, or over there is good enough. That's, that's already great, you know, won't do so much harm there to the watershed, whatever. You actually have a lot more opportunities, I think, people realize. This is also because, um, getting back to my sort of the myth of fragile nature, a lot of activities that we thought hammered species and systems don't hammer as much. And that allows us to work with companies. So this is Indonesia. Of course, array of things are a conservation icon and a highly threatened species. The story is, when you cut down the forest for oil palm and plant oil palm, it removes the habitat and orangutans come out of there. Data show to the contrary. Second largest orangutan population we found in Indonesia has been, been in an oil palm plantation. That's mulch. This is one of them. With that dark is not this is dark. This is a dark to tranquilize it, so we study it with markers. Totally shocked by that. That's a little palm plantation there in the lower left. So they do very well in the um, in that habitat. So why do we have to work with companies? Well, it turns out that the reason that the rain tanks are getting ham hammered in many of these places is that they're doing so well that the oil palm companies think they're a pest and eat the, the nuts, the fruit. They think they're a pest, and pay a bounty to villagers five dollars a hand to kill them. So our story, our classical story was, oh my god, you know, you, you convert the forest to oil palm, and you ruin the habitat for orangutans. Total misdiagnosis. The real diagnosis is direct hunting and killing at a remarkable rate. And yeah, the companies aren't good because they're paying a bounty for it. But nonetheless, this tells you that there's a way to work with that company because you're not saying you, that, that the oil palm is a totally bad habitat. You're saying don't play a bounty on it. And probably, we don't have the data to do this, but I just can't imagine that that being the best. Probably, you can convince them with data that really, it's not worth putting a bounty on. It's kind of a waste of money. The last one is nature for people. Uh, this is a, uh, a habitat type up above Quito. It's, it's a high Andes habitat type called Paramo. And it's a really spongy, you know, it's like 3,000, 4,000 feet, I mean, meters. Um, it's a spongy type of habitat that um, is, is sort of rich in wildlife, but it stores water very well and becomes sort of a mass, uh, sort of a natural reservoir for downstream cities. So recognizing that, one of our coolest projects that is not initially, you know, protect wildlife, protect nature for nature's sake, is in Quito, Ecuador. So Quito's population, pretty big population, um, was running out of water, and the water was also heavily sedimented. The head monitoring, heavily sedimented, and deteriorated water quality. We got business to initially Business being hydroelectric companies, they care about water because they don't want sediments. That interferes their ability to make money off electricity. Water suppliers, a beer company and a florist company, can originally create a fund and pay for upstream management of a bioreserve to better manage that type of habitat. And that meant no grazing, less farming, fencing, and sort of minimizing the damaging activity. We have data to show it's working from the conservation point of view. We're in the process, ironically, because we started this as a conservation organization. Um, we didn't collect enough data initially to show it's working from the people point of view, show us really is providing better water, but we're doing that now. But it's a, 
And this particular model, upstream, this is what New York City does for gas tanks. But upstream habitat providing water to cities is, is a globally relevant model. We are already starting to have this in 12 other cities in Latin America. And it's cheaper, much, much cheaper to have your natural habitat provide clean water than to build a treatment plant. Another one, I think, um, has been made much less of. So this, this example, this pain <coughs> for upstream water, pain to protect nature for what it gives to upstream water is there are a lot of examples of it. I think it's going to grow a lot and pretty much become really an institutionalized and major form of conservation. This next one doesn't have any examples really that well. I think you're going to see it. Floodplains and flooding. And the recent floods in Mississippi where they had to blow up the, the levees to allow the flood to escape before it came down and, and um, trashed more lanes. The reason I say this is going to, that natural floodplains are going to gain adherence is the Wall Street Journal. The Wall Street Journal ran an editorial. So it wasn't a columnist, you know, the regular editorial part saying maybe we should rethink levees and consider using natural floodplains. When the Wall Street Journal starts writing those things, you're on to something. It may really get trash. So that's something nature provides you. What's something else that nature might provide you? This is perhaps flaky, but I would like to see there be more research on this. I think we all know that our kids don't spend much time in nature, but we did. Remember, we weren't nature you know, freaks when we were young. We played outdoors a lot. We were just out and around a lot. Um, this is a figure for college freshmen today. Uh, there are so many figures. If you've read Richard Bloom, you see some of these. No matter how you look at it, it's an astonishing difference. Children, they don't roam very, very far. There's a lot of reasons for it, but they don't. There's beginning to be research that talks about interacting with nature actually provides psychological and health benefits to children. None of the studies are that well done, that frankly. They can talk a lot about the press, but um, none of ours have, you know, as good as I would like. There's cool studies where they where they have kids walk in a city, uh, walk take you know an hour walk in a city, an hour walk in a city natural environment, kind of like a city urban park, and an hour walk in nature, and then they give them these uh, focus attention tests, standard types of tests where you see how well they can remember numbers or say it backwards, and you can significant results that the more natural it is, the better they can focus on the diet. Um, there's a paper in Nature, this one's one of my favorites. Uh, I don't know about to explain the graphs, I just put it up here to talk about. But it actually did brain imaging, so it could look at people who grew up in the country versus grew up in the city, or who lived in a country, or who lived in a city. So the two treat, the two different types of people were sorted in, term, in terms of where they grew up, urban versus country, and where they live now, urban versus country. And they uh, almost tortured them. They gave them a, a stress test. The stress test was to give them sort of mathematical questions and make them answer them really fast and sort of scream at them when they weren't getting it right. And then imaging their brain to see how stressed they were. And it turned out that the, that the, um, that the um, urban were most stressed and suffered the greatest, strongest stress response you know, to this. this, this um, treatment, if you will. Now, it's correlated. This, you know, there are a lot of other differences between those groups of people. But, you know, I would, I would like to, you know, I'd like to see our kids that we take out in nature. I'd like to see um, them become, you know, we do experiments to see how they actually change so you can actually do real experiments. So it's a really odd area. I don't know whether it's going to pan out. But it's not ridiculous. It's not ridiculous to think that experience in nature has real, tangible health and psychological benefits for our children. And if that's the case, that's a pretty powerful message, isn't it? That's a pretty powerful message. Terrific in my research. So all that is, you know, if we if we think about the value that nature gives us that we care about, so the examples I gave 
were water. And there already is payments being given for water for conservation. Floodplains. Pretty soon, I think there will be payments for those. And there's tons of others, pollination and so forth. But uh, kids. <laughs> Once we emphasize the value, so instead of just romanticizing, oh, this lone, this you know, lone warrior, that, you know, outlining himself in pristine nature and making that the image, the metaphor for conservation. Why shouldn't the metaphor be that nature and the environment provides us with things of huge economic value? and huge human well-being value. And we'll get conservation done. I want to mention also the power of the community. So Eleanor Ostrom, the only and first woman to win a Nobel Prize in economics, did all sorts of research. Uh, uh, you know, when do we make good resource and environmental decisions? And the answer is, is, is when it's a community decision, and the stakeholders feel heavily involved, so it's a community decision, and they can see the resources and the consequences of their decisions. <clears throat> and, but it's an optimistic, it's, it's sort of a very sort of hopeful view that people don't always act out of self-interest and greed. You can get good examples, and her examples come from marine conservation and forestry. We found, so as we started to, to engage with kids in schools, We've done more and more polling. We're just trying to understand kids. As we try to broaden our constituency, and we deal with kids in, in, in schools, we, we started you know, doing other surveys to see how people spend their time. What, what motivates them? What gener by age class, generation Y, generation X, and so on. Generation Y, that's 20 to 30, is highly engaged. They want to be engaged, be active, want to be part of a social network and active. Social network fits with Eleanor Oscar. We want to be active. We had a volunteer day for our work in, in, in the Gulf of Mexico where we have labor intensively, people come and help reconstruct oyster reefs along the shoreline of the Gulf. As you, as you can reconstruct oyster reefs, it's got all sorts of benefits. Builds beaches, provides habitat for fish, oysters and cells are great to eat, sediment that nourishes the beaches. Um, when they've been destroyed by years of abuse of the, of the Gulf. Cost a million dollars per mile of oyster reef to re rebuild. A million dollars. So we started using volunteers. We couldn't handle volunteers. We put, it, we put out a call, and we, we got 10 times more volunteers than we thought. Which is overwhelming. Because people wanted to do something. It was tangible. That's not bad. I think we could do a lot of volunteers. You know, let's remember that, you know, the, uh, I have, uh, Bill McKibben, you know, had a quote about iPhones in this generation, and he, and it's the, the, he calls it the iPad, the, the iPad the Indian generation. Now, Bill McKibben is a good environmentalist, but what a stupid thing to say. How to alienate a generation, and how to fail to see the potential of this whole part of the culture, to instead of it being called out you know, the iPad idiot generation, to harness it to be on the side of conservation environments. Why not have, you know, iPhone apps that, well, they already do have, that you can identify birds, you hear bird songs, but make people part of the network to monitor the environment. These things all have geographic locations. You could actually be part of a data collection. So what I want to end on is, is you know, my, my vision for, for, for conservation would be corporations, technology, and a diverse, broad base of public support. And I show Richard Nixon up there. He's not signing the Endangered Species Act. That I, should have, I should lie to him and say he is. But remember, he did sign the Endangered Species Act. And remember, when the Endangered Species Act passed, it passed unanimously in the Senate. And Richard Nixon gave a speech pro-conservation that would, I mean, it would send shells, I mean, so pro-conservation when he signed it. It was, the environment and conservation was not 
a partisan issue. We will only succeed if the environment and conservation stops being a partisan issue. And part of that is this one of the mistakes, and it's a little bit of, think about what we did long, wrong in cap and trade. We made cap and trade in the climate a partisan issue because we jumped to the government's role. And what is partisan is the role of, of government. We should have first emphasized and jumped to the environmental problem and the economic cost of that problem. And then let the Democrats and Republicans work out the government role in that afterwards. But we jumped to a divisive solution before establishing the issue. We have to have ways of, of making the environment not partisan. Frankly, I, you know, I think there is hope in that. But it's emphasizing different things. So I'll end with this. It's one of my favorite uh, paintings. Not a really famous painter, but some of you may know this. Ed Rupert a, a, a Quaker minister. It's called the Peaceable Kingdom. Really kind of a nice picture. But I like it because I, I use this as my sort of conservation vision. Because you have all the animals getting along, the people getting along, and also, you know, the indigenous people uh, getting along. And in a, in a sense, then, the future of, of conservation in the environment is, is much more a vision like this. And it's going to have to embrace a broad constituency and business. Those are the two things. That if it embraces that and elevates the science and a little bit less of the fear mongering, and the overstatement of fragile nature will be in good shape. Thanks. I'm going to have to take questions.
So a lot of companies will not sign off on that. Um, so, but then given that, so our, our goal is to do the analyses that give some guidance to what Dow should or shouldn't do. We will choose, there, there's a strategy here. You can't, you, you're not going to go into an old plant that's got a heavily invested infrastructure and doesn't have any, many options. So you want to find your engagement where you think there are options for them going forward, so they're not blocking the corner. So for any corporate engagement, I, I think you want to go into it with some options. Uh, we try to find those options. The reason it's taken us so long, we got the money maybe a year ago. We didn't start the science until um, maybe a month ago because we had to work with the company to find our, to identify what I'm saying. So that makes it more likely that we already did a success. Frankly. And it's a trust building. It would feel better if it was a true marriage. You know, if the Nature Conservancy was getting from Dow uh, an education in terms of how they can work with various companies and vice versa, the amount of money that changed hands made it feel to many people as a one-sided relationship. Right. And it was a vast amount. Right, right. So it was $10 million. I think it was more than that over the course of 10 years. I don't know. It was 10 million. Okay. Um, but uh, it actually is that. So, so let, let me tell you some of the things we're doing. So we are bringing other companies with Dow. So we're, we're starting to have lunches, and not just the Conservancy. The Conservancy, other environmental groups, scientists, we'll get some academic scientists, and corporate people, finance and corporate people, to start having lunches together talking about metrics. And Dow's helping us arrange those. And because it's never going to be, you're not, what you really are trying to do is change the culture. You, you, you really want a company to be evaluated more seriously on the basis of its environmental performance is what you're going for. But if you're going to demand that of a company, you have to help it and give it tools so it can manage towards that environmental performance. But there is a little bit more to take. Sure. Um, I was struck by the graph showing the drop in support for the environmental movement from the late 90s to the first part of the century. And uh, I wonder, that doesn't reflect a much broader change in our culture. Because you could say that, you know, you, you told the story from the point of view of the environmental movement, but there's a lot of other things going on in society at the same time. And the end of civil discourse and politics, for instance, would grab very much the same way. Um, well, a lot of them are I, I see your point, and that's certainly true, but I'll tell you two other polling results. One is a lot of the ways when you ask these questions that you ask them to, to you give them a list of the uh, problems, like the debt, unemployment, health care, the environment, and so forth. So that's one way. And what you see is, is, is what people think are the most important issues. So when you ask the question now, that's different than the way I, I pose it. It also holds. So it's the other issues that are elevated over it. Um, I don't dispute your discourse, but I mean your notion about the parts of discourse. But a positive story, we're going to hold this this winter, I mean summer. I might have been only four weeks ago in Alaska. And it's because there's some really precarious things going on with rivers in Alaska that may mess up the salmon. And we, and we explicitly asked about the national debt, the recession, taxes, and actually spending tax money to, per, to restore our area zones to protect rivers of salmon. And 90% of the population went for invest tax increase and, um, and actually uh, investing that in salmon conservation. That's unique to Alaska because they're very connected to the salmon. And the culture is very connected to the salmon. So even though I gave that bad news, when we got that from Alaska, we were astonished. The polling company that did it, which is They'd never seen anything like it. The, the last thing public really cared that much about Sam. Okay, the blue shirt. Um, I'm an environmental toxicologist. Uh, two points. One is your list of topics you think seem to show that you are accepting the terms of the polluters. Uh, you're accepting their values, their derogatory terms of that people care about the environment. Uh, the second thing is that you talk about uh, the ecosystems not being fragile. Well, evidence is showing that as uh, global climate change advances, that the ecosystems are not going to move north or up the mountain or whatever to get uh, back to where uh, the temperature and rainfall patterns. They're going to 
to change. So the fragility that we have to worry about is about human society. Uh, we have at least three times too many people for a sustainable world. And as everything changes, as uh, it takes more and more money for us to manage to uh, adapt ourselves to the change in society. So when people talk about saving the Earth, uh, there's nothing to worry about the Earth. Uh, we have to worry about our own species, and we are the fragile part of the ecosystem because we are so dependent upon the conditions that have been going on in the Holocene for what? For the time in which our modern humans have been uh, converting to agriculture and vastly increasing their numbers. So I think we need to worry about ourselves a lot more and that we need to preserve the rest of nature because that's how we have been successful, all the successful, I would say. So there is a fragility, but we're looking the wrong way. We need to look at ourselves and how proud. Look at uh, Hurricane Irene coming. And uh, we'll see what that damage does to us and how, how many millions and billions of dollars of damage can we afford before our society collapses. So I must agree with much of what you say. In fact, the whole point of valuing nature is, is exactly that. I agree that, that we're probably more fragile than nature. I disagree. I think it's, a, it's an open scientific. You made a statement about three times more people. But the carrying capacity of the Earth in terms of sustainability is an unsettled and, and totally open scientific question. Uh, go to Israel. Israel has 10 times the population density as we do. 10 times the the, the lower 48, so I'm not factoring in Alaska. 10 times the population density, a higher percentage in nature reserve and wilderness areas, totally self-supporting in terms of food, a precarious water situation that they still manage it. And they even manage to escape, you know, have transboundary management agreements about managing some of their water. And they are an example of, of you know, just that it's, it's not so easy to sit there and count the population and say it's exceeding the carrier capacity. It's how we live and use the land and water. It's how we live on and use the land and water. I'm really reluctant to put any sort of number like what you did. And I think there's a lot of scientists who will be reluctant to do that. One more back here. Uh, first of all, I, I would like to say that I there were many uh, insightful points you made that I believe we can all take home and ponder and hopefully uh, put into some uh, practical uh, implementation. But there were a couple of observations you, you uh, offered about the Nature Conservancy's effort, which abstractly is, is uh, most inspiring, to attract young people to uh, participate, to become volunteers, and to uh, uh, draw upon uh, the natural kingdom. But Therein, I think, lies a problem for the Nature Conservancy, and perhaps many NGOs that do this sort of thing that was suggesting, namely to do partnering projects with outfits like, let's say, Dow or Monsanto. And concretely, I know at the college at which I'm employed, I sometimes try to encourage my students to join various NGOs to participate in whichever ones they uh, feel are most relevant to their concerns. And one of their responses, uh, and I, I just heard this uh, last semester from a couple of students, was they say, yeah, yeah, well, look at the Nature Conservancy. Who, who was the uh, chair of it? Well, Hank Paulson. Who is Hank Paulson? He just happens to be, uh, he was the CEO for uh, Goldman Sachs. And many students uh, uh, take that to just reinforce the already widespread cynicism uh, and alienation many young people feel nowadays toward any sort of uh, political participation. And so could it be that the Nature Conservancy and many other uh, NGOs might be shooting themselves in the foot by uh, embracing uh, this corporate uh, 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 generosity uh, that, say, uh, Dow and other companies offer, precisely because it uh, reinforces the kind of cynicism and non-participation which so many young people today are uh, displaying anyway. So I think you make, I mean, I, I think that's, a, that's, a, that's actually a fair worry. So I teach at college campuses and so forth. And there's a, there's a worry. That's why I say it's an interesting dual strategy that may seem at opposition. Broadening the constituency, reaching the younger generation, and dealing with the corporations. And 
That's a challenging dual strategy for the reason you exactly said, because there's no question there is this impression that dealing with the corporations is sort of like uh, selling out to the corporate world. I would say the defense against that is to collect data and have measures and make it outcome-based. It's just like being anti-technology. I don't believe in being anti-corporation. All corporations, it's not like those people. I know Hank. Whatever you think about Hank, Hank is a naturalist. He loves snakes and frogs. He's an amazing, you know, he really, really sincerely cares about nature. So, you know, it, but I think the picture you paint is a real challenge for us in implementing the strategy. I think the way to overcome it is to try to be as transparent as possible and get data out there about what happens. Make it be results like it. Just like with the cassava. So you don't reject genetically engineered organisms because they're genetically engineered. You ask, what's the outcome of that cassava? You don't reject corporations just because it's the corporate world. You ask, what's the outcome? And that's, that's a different question. Many thanks. This has clearly uh, provoked a thought and question among our audience. Um, and uh, this has been great uh, to hear you articulate what Nature Conservancy is all about and what you're bringing to it uh, in science. Uh, so many thanks for being with us tonight.